What's up guys, it's Jay back again with Tech Everything. So if you're looking to build a new computer or you are looking to upgrade your old CPU and you don't want to do any overclocking, the Intel Core i7-7700 is a great alternative to the 7700K. Today we're going to take a look at it, check out its benchmarks, and compare it to its older brother, the 6700. Unlike in the past from Intel, the jump from Skylake to Kaby Lake does not represent a giant performance gain. Instead, it is a refinement of that same architecture. The really, the main difference is a small set of features that you can get, like Intel Optane, as well as some new features for H.264 decoding, but there are no increase, there is no increase in the IPCs or instructions per clock. So at the same speed, you should be getting the same exact performance. Now these chips are clocked a little faster. So the older 6700 is clocked with a base of 3.4 gigahertz and a boost up to four gigahertz. Now that boost is on one core. That's the single core boost the top speed for all four cores or eight threads is 3.7 gigahertz. Now the new chip, the 7700, has a base of 3.6 gigahertz and has a boost of 4.2. Now that 4.2 is also a single core boost, but unlike the 3.7 on the 6700, this chip goes up to 4.0 on all cores. Now that is a pretty substantial boost in speed, especially when you factor in that it has the same 65 watt TDP. So let's take a look at some of the performance numbers and see how that shakes out. The system I'll be using to test the CPU consists of an MSI H170i Pro AC motherboard, uh, 32 gigs of DDR4 Corsair LPX RAM, an Intel 600P 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD, uh, Zotac GTX 1050Ti, and it will be cooled by a Noctua NH-L9i. Before we get started, it's important to note, if you are using a 100 series motherboard, H170, 110, Z170, anything, you have to make sure that your motherboard has upgraded firmware in the BIOS so that it can support the new 7th gen chips. Mine did, make sure yours does before you run out and buy one, because without it, it most likely will not be compatible. So now let's move on to the benchmarks. Up first we have Cinebench with the 7700 getting an 874 and the 6700 trailing it with the 811. That is an 8% increase and a very admirable score. Up next we have Geekbench. The 7700 got a 16,059 for the multi-threaded test as well as a 4,066 for the single thread with the 6700 coming in behind it in both again with a 14879 and a 3821. That's a 6% increase for the single thread and an 8% for the multi-core. The Passmark Suite continues this trend with the 7700 getting in an 11,420, with the 6700 getting in a 10,488 for a 9% increase in performance. While there is only a 10 point total difference in the 3D Mark total score, when you look at the CPU calculation, the 7700 got a 5,012, the 6700 got a 4,664 for a 7% increase in performance. I popped open Adobe and tested out a small but demanding file for the render test. The file was rendered in both 4K and 1080p. The 7700 recorded 12 minutes and 56 seconds for the 4K render and 4 minutes and 41 for the 1080p, beating the 6700 by 7% and 6% respectively. But now you're starting to see a pattern in terms of the performance gains. Temperatures will largely depend on the cooler and case that you use, but just for an example, you can see this was done in an open air environment with a Noctua NHL and 9i and you can take a look at the temps and see that they were pretty good, well within stable ranges, never peaking above 87, even under a heavy Prime 95 load. And lastly, I used my handy watt meter to measure the load at the wall for just the CPU, no GPU included in this test, and the results were very interesting. 7700 maxed out at 106 watts, with 36.8 watts being its idle draw. While the 6700, surprisingly, even with the lower frequencies on the clocks, came in a little bit higher at 108 watts. That was surprising to me, and 37.6 watts at idle. That was very interesting. I thought for sure 
with the three megahertz jump in terms of peak loads, you would see an increase in watt usage, but it, that's just the opposite. It actually dropped it by two watts. Now this is within the margin of error. It could be that, but it seems to be that the Cabby Lake processors are a little more efficient. I'm seeing that from other people's testings with the K parts as well. So as you see from the benchmarks, if you have a 6700, there's not a huge need to upgrade. You're gonna see an average of six to 9% increase in performance for any given task. Now it is a nice little increase. The rendering times were better if you're doing stuff like that, like I am, that really helps. If you're running a small form factor build, this 65 watt TDP part may be the top CPU for you. It, it's easy to cool and it's powerful. If you're in the market for a CPU and you don't want to overclock, but you do want something that's powerful, this would be a great option. It's $30 less than the 7700K. So what do you guys think? What CPU are you running? Are you building a small form factor system like me that can utilize a beastly but power frugal CPU like this? Let me know in the comments. If there's any other tests you want me to run or anything, let me know in the comments. I can always add them to the article. I'll drop a link below as well as links for the 7700 if you want to check one out for yourself. As always, thanks for watching, guys. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you like the video. I'm Jay. This is Tech Everything, and I'll see you next time.